best thing that they can do is lock them up and throw away the key. But they're not doing that. So if they're not going to do that, at least let us know who they are so we can watch them. I've got a lot of sympathy for her, but I just don't think it's fair to a lot of people. Not fair to you. To me and a lot of people. It's Megan's Law. It's still stirring strong feelings across the country, and it's what's on our docket for this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process is made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding is provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, publishers of print and electronic information for and about the legal community, including the legislative manual. Few crimes shocked us more than the murder of seven-year-old Megan Kanka, and few laws had more momentum than what's come to be known in New Jersey and around the country as Megan's Law. It's the law designed to keep track of sex offenders by at the least requiring them to register with police and at the most requiring county prosecutors could to go door to door to tell their neighbors to watch out. I'm Ray Brown and the constitutionality of Megan's law is still in some question, though the notifications have begun and in the next half hour, we'll hear from both sides in the ongoing Megan's law debate. But first, here's Sandra King with some very personal perspectives on what Megan's law really means. Ray, there are so many with a stake in Megan's law, not just the parents who hope the law will mean protection for their kids, but the county prosecutors who will have to notify the communities, the judges who've started hearing the appeals from the targeted sex offenders, and the public defenders who've been ordered to represent them. But no one has a greater stake than the mother whose little girl would have turned nine this month, and the John Doe's from whom she insists we all still need protection. I wish I could sit with her face to face and tell her how I feel what happened. It's a, a horrible tragedy and a loss, but I really don't think it's fair to put so many people through something that have paid their time whether they did it or not. He's one of nearly 3,000 in New Jersey, all convicted sex offenders who share the alias John Doe. I've got a lot of sympathy for her, but I just don't think it's fair to a lot of people. Not fair to you. To me and a lot of people. And this is the woman he'd like to confront. It was the murder of her daughter in July of 94 that led just three months later to what the country now knows as Megan's Law. The best thing that they can do is lock them up and throw away the key. But they're not doing that. So if they're not going to do that, at least let us know who they are so we can watch them. Megan's mother believes her child might still be alive if she'd been able to protect her from the man across the street, a twice convicted sex offender accused of her rape and murder. And though the house that haunted Maureen Kanka has given way to a park that bears her Megan's name, she is the last person that John Doe could convince that Megan's law is unconstitutional and unfair. They were given a chance to be law-abiding citizens, and they broke that. And you have to remember why they broke it and how they broke it. They didn't break it by stealing from somebody. They broke it by molesting and raping our children. And despite the claims of innocence by this John Doe, a jury found him guilty of a hideous crime, forcing two six-year-old boys to perform fellatio. He spent four years in state prison and four on parole. So once the state Supreme Court cleared the way last fall and the John Doe letters at last went out, he got one. I was almost ready to pack up and move out of state because how can you live in a community like that? It's never going to be kept a secret even though it says it will be. And it's really frightening. His designation, Tier 2, defined as moderate risk in the law's three-tiered system. 
Not the door to door alarm required by not Tier 3, but still notification oh, near where he aware. lives and works of community institutions from nursery schools to women's shelters. A virtual guarantee, his lawyer insists, that before too long, the word would be out. It's going to start out, you know, did you hear about little Jimmy's father? Uh, you know, he's a child abuser. But once that happens, it's going to get back not only to little Jimmy, but to little Jimmy's classmates. And that is what's going to create horror stories. Still, Megan's law supporters from the U.S. Attorney and the State Attorney General, who've argued it in court, to the governor who enthusiastically signed it into law, deny that the law is either double jeopardy or punitive. Not to punish them, but to protect their neighbors, their towns, or people around them. There is a higher rate of recidivism for sex offenders. The law is designed to assess that risk, to determine those people who are most likely to be a risk uh, when they're out in society. But Ray Zeltner was able to convince a court that despite his crime, this John Doe was not a great risk. He was reclassified as Tier 1, requiring yearly registration with police of information intended only for a state police data bank. But this John Doe says he's still afraid. How confident are you that the police will? keep your identity and your whereabouts safe. I can never be sure of it. I could be walking down the street, somebody could be going through a file all of a sudden and say, well, let's see what we can do with him. I'm always looking over my shoulder. Because of the Supreme Court's ruling, every John Doe's entitled to a hearing, an appeal. Another Zeltner client lost his, and now his lawyer's afraid it could mean his life. If his kids find out, he's going to commit suicide. He can't live with it. Just cannot live with it. You really believe that will happen? It'll happen. If his kids find out. But Maureen Kanka has her own dead to mourn. I have a dead little girl because somebody couldn't control himself. Not only did he rape her, but he murdered her. And that's something we have to live with forever. And the attorney general says her fears are reserved for the lives of the next young victims. We will be able to, through, through Megan's Law, give people information that will enable them to protect their children. And if we save one life, we'll have, we will have accomplished a lot. But while the state Supreme Court has spoken, the Third Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals has not. The court could call a halt to the notifications, at least for those whose sex crimes came before the law was passed in October 94. But the state of New Jersey isn't waiting for the Third Circuit. And, Ray, the Attorney General wouldn't even talk to us about what might happen if the Third Circuit does a fact say no. Sandy, the judicial challenge is still underway. And when we come back, a former prosecutor who believes in Megan's law faces off against a former Third Circuit judge who says the law has some serious problems. I think it makes sense uh, to the extent that, that people want to know that, that a sex offender is living in their neighborhood so that uh, they can take appropriate action with respect to their children. Being a mother, um, I, I think you know, we should know uh, when these type of people are in our community. It probably should have been in legislation years ago. I can see some advantages, but I think just because somebody has committed a crime is not an indication that they're going to commit the crime a hundred times again. When um, serve time for their crime, you would think that, you know, they should be able to lead a normal life without having that stigma attached to them. Um, I don't know. I'm, it's, a, it's a hard issue. I don't know. And it's one of those public issues on which almost everyone has an opinion, especially those on both sides of the Megan's Law process. Former Third Circuit Judge John Gibbons, who's defended a Megan's Law target, and John Fahey, who as Bergen County prosecutor, brought Megan's Law to bear on some of its earliest targets. Jay, why do we need Megan's Law? 
We need Megan's Law so that neighborhoods uh, can know that if there is a pedophile, especially a pedophile in their midst, uh, they can be made aware of it and they can perhaps take, take extra precautions uh, for their children. Now the pedophiles we're talking about are men who have already been convicted and in many instances already served their time, is that correct? In many cases, people that have been convicted and have served their time. Judge Gibbons, there are those who say that's a violation of the Double Jeopardy Clause. Uh, you got a view on that? Well, Judge Politan in the District Court in New Jersey so ruled, and that issue is pending before the Third Circuit at the present time. The Supreme Court of New Jersey considered the same issue and said otherwise. Uh, the test, of course, uh, for whether or not there is a violation of the double jeopardy clause by applying this law retroactively is whether or not the law inflicts punishment to any degree. By retroactively, you mean applying it to men who had already done their time before the law was passed? Yes, who had maxed out mm -hmm. their complete sentence. And maybe and in some instances in might even have been reintegrated into the community? Uh, exactly. Uh, in, indeed, in the, the client whom I'm representing before the Third Circuit had completed his time, had been reintegrated into the community, had married a woman about his own age, he was in his mid-40s, was practicing his trade, and as a result of Megan's law, was dr driven from the state of New Jersey. Jay, uh, the courts have split, and we assume they're going to continue to debate this for a time. As a practical matter, why isn't that another punishment on top of the punishment they've already served, and maybe one that can drive men away from their homes? Well, the issue is, is that punishment, or is when someone gets convicted of, of an offense, or when someone even gets arrested of, of, uh, for an offense, that's a public record, period. Unless there's an expungement, that is a public record. It is not a record that is easily accessible, but if I wanted to check on a neighbor, and I knew that that neighbor had spent all of their life in Essex County, I could go down to the uh, county clerk and find out, perhaps if they had uh, a, a conviction for, for sex, a sex offense or any other kind of But offense. under this statute, in some instances, the prosecutor's offices are going to have an affirmative duty to go out and tell other groups and other citizens and people about the conviction. But they're going out and telling them about a public record. A, a conviction is not some, sec but a some, public, secret, uh, some secret document. But a public record, which as a matter of fact, wouldn't have been known to most folks. In that, fact, the whole purpose of the statute is to more broadly broadcast this prior record of the person. You're absolutely right. It is not an easily accessible record. But what you have to do is to what the weighing that occurs here is uh, the, the weighing of a neighborhood's right to know who's living in their midst, especially if the record is a public record, against the individual's uh, rights uh, to, uh, to keep that record private. That's the way I view it. But if, that's, if it isn't punishment to tell the community about a record a man has which is for a crime that's uh, widely viewed very negatively, it seems to me that's a pretty good example of what punishment is, isn't it? I don't don't know whether that's punishment or not. What, you, what you're doing is telling the truth about an event that a person uh, uh, did commit at a previous point in time. Uh, Jay, you're doing a lot more than that under this law. You are also making a prediction about future behavior because the notification statute requires, as originally written, required the prosecutor and now is rewritten by the Supreme Court of New Jersey, requires some New Jersey court to make a prediction about the level of likelihood of repeat offenses. Now, we have had an unfortunate history in this country on the subject of predicting future human behavior. In the 20s, even so eminent a person as Oliver Wendell Holmes bit on the fallacy that genetics can explain human behavior and predict criminality. When we gave up on that fallacy for a number of years, we tried phrenology. And as late as the 40s in some prisons in this country, including New Jersey, they were feeling bumps on people's heads to predict future criminal behavior. And the process that this law establishes for predicting future recidivism among people who have completely served their time is just more phrenology. Well, Go ahead. well first of all, the, uh, the recidivism What's phrenology, rate, Judge, just so we know? Predicting human by behavior by feeling bumps on right. people's and heads. And they actually had measuring devices yes. and elaborate so-called yeah, and, 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 and the kind of prediction that's going on here is just about as accurate. Do you think that this is no, a this this is phrenology? Not, this is not phrenology. Number one, you're um, the levels of notification are now going to be determined by a judge, and uh, on the, the first level of notification, only the police department gets notified, no one else. 
the second level community groups that have registered uh, with the police get notified and in the th third level uh, the uh, community itself gets notified as well as the groups and the, and the police department. I will agree with what uh, the, uh, the defense attorney said that there's very little difference between level two and level three because once several community groups know it's uh, going to be known. So, uh, but the issue is for someone that uh, has led uh, a good existence has gotten back on the right track there should be no community notification. Uh, number two the reason I think that uh, it is important is the recidivism rate is about 40 percent uh, for uh, pedophiles. That was there was a study that uh, occurred up in Canada over the course of about 25 years and it showed that the recidivism rate was about 40 percent. It isn't limited to pedophiles. It refers to all sexual offenders and indeed as retroactively applied it only applies to sexual offenders who have received treatment at the Avenel Diagnostic Center. Thus, retroactively, it only reaches about 10% of the people who are actually convicted of sexual offenses. If it, if it, uh, I, I don't know how accurate the prediction is about recidivism among pedophiles, but it, the most interesting thing about that offense is that it doesn't, this statute doesn't even protect the uh, children most at risk because most sexual offenses against children are not committed by strangers, they're committed by family members. Jay, the judge seems to be saying that there's a flaw in the statistics that the legislature and the courts are now relying on and that they don't provide the kind of protection that's been suggested. It's that protection that's the justification for not viewing this as punishment. This. It's a public record. The, uh, the problem with this kind of an offense, and I think uh, the way the legislature looks at this and the way the prosecutors look at this, is this is not a, uh, an offense like a burglary or a robbery. People, uh, especially pedophiles, when they commit their offense, they are doing it because of an obsession or a compulsion uh, within them. We started speaking about Avenel. T to, for a prisoner to go to Avenel or for a defendant to go to Avenel, they have to be viewed of as repetitive uh, and compulsive, which means there's something innate in that person that makes them want uh, to commit a sex offense. It's analogous uh, to a, a compulsive gambler or, or, or perhaps an alcoholic or a, or, or a drug addict. For that reason, given that this is uh, uh, in the nature almost of a sickness, uh, when that person gets out, that sickness is not cured, that compulsion is not cured, and people in the neighborhoods, I believe, have a right to know that someone who is compel compulsive and is a compulsive sex offender and is living in their midst, they should be aware that this person is living, living with them. Ray, the term repetitive and compulsive is not a psychiatric term, it's not a medical term, it's a, it's legal. a legal term. And it, it's a term of uh, very slippery and indefinite meaning. Now, at one time, people sent to Avenel were being paroled at, in, before their maximum term at 91% of the, the time. Only 9% back in the 70s who were sent to Avenel for treatment were held for their maximum term. Let me in 1991, 83% of people who are sent there for treatment are held for their maximum term, which seems to me to suggest that the so-called experts at Avenel who are treating these people concede that this isn't a medical condition. Let me ask you a question that I've wanted to ask for a long time, which is why, if you feel so profoundly that there is such slipshod scientific support for this whole concept of predictability. Why do you think our state Supreme Court has been willing to embrace this statutory scheme on the grounds that it predicts accurately? I don't know that they did uh, uh, uphold it on the ground that it predicts accurately. Uh, they saw it as having serious procedural due process problems because they rejected the Attorney General's position that no one has a liberty or privacy interest that would be offended by this kind of a statute. But they were willing to engage, embrace a scheme which in large measure countenances significant invasion into the lives of ex-offenders on the grounds that the legislature was rational in believing it and could Oliver predict. Wendell Holmes embraced genetic sterilization as a cure for the crime problem. The justices are, are not uh, omnipotent. 
Okay. Well, like uh, judges are not omnipotent, I will concede. I, I agree with that. Uh, this is a situation where uh, th this compulsion, whether whatever whether the term is a legal term or a medical term, people that are uh, pedophiles have a desire uh, to have sex with children, and that is not cured uh, easily. When someone gets released from the criminal justice system uh, and they have done their time, uh, they're not on probation. They're typically not on parole, and they're as free uh, to, to to walk around as any of us uh, are free to walk around. If with with Megan's law uh, type of legislation, uh, at a minimum, those people can be monitored. If they need to be monitored, those people can be forced uh, to, to at least buy their medication if that's something that will help them. And uh, if they are being monitored, perhaps other, other things can occur so that if they need help, they'll also be able to get help. In the dissenting opinion in the state Supreme Court case, Justice Stein raised the question, some questions about vigilantism, which we've seen in New Jersey, which we've seen in some other states where statutes like these have been passed. Is that a concern at all to you, Judge Gibbons? Of course it is. It, it, it has resulted in a, a number of uh, former offenders leaving the state of New Jersey just for fear of vigilantism. And it's not just uh, the vigilantism of coming into a home and uh, beating up the occupants has happened in Warren County or of burning a house down such as happened in the state of Washington it's the vigilantism represented by people like Curtis Sliwa who showed up in my client's neighborhood and handed out flyers uh, which as a matter of fact were defamatory they they said that he was convicted of something he'd never been convicted of, for example, and which made it impossible for him to continue to live in the neighborhood. Now, Jay, you've been in law enforcement virtually your whole adult life. You must be offended by the thought or concern about vigilantism and people responding, perhaps in a human way, but in a way that may be very illegal and improper in terms of either verbal or other kinds of assaults on these persons who are the subject of notification. It's very disturbing. And in, War in the Warren County case, uh, some uh, thugs went into uh, a person's house who they believed had been a sex offender. They went to the wrong apartment and beat up someone that had nothing the to do guy. with Megan's law. But what about the Sliwa incident? Um, probably not a fair way to call it, but the response of people who may pick it, who may engage in lawful activity or on the borderlines, but who engage in what constitutes harassment and conduct that can drive a person out of the community, out of the state. I am not happy with that. I don't uh, endorse uh, Curtis Lieber, but again, the First Amendment gives him that protection. And what he did was he went into Passaic County. But this legislation gives him the ammunition and perhaps the incentive. How do we... But if Curtis Lieber or one of his people or one of his minions wanted to go to the county courthouse, they could get a record of everyone that is, has been convicted of a sex but offense. The fact is they didn't do it before. But, but they so, could have. And the question is, are we now facing potential activities of that kind that we didn't before? And is it justified and can we protect against it? Well, Worse than that, are we encouraging it by state action? When we were maintaining the records uh, of arrests and dispositions of criminal offenses in county courthouses, we weren't encouraging people to come and look them up for the purposes of engaging in uh, vigilanteism. But the very purpose of this legislation is to get neighbors stirred up. Now, just, that's the very purpose I of it. The, I, do, I do not believe the purpose of it is to get neighbors stirred up. The purpose of it is to if, if, uh, warn if it families. Isn't, it doesn't serve any purpose. The purpose is to warn families that there may be someone on your block that your children shouldn't be playing with, uh, that your children shouldn't be associating with. And if Megan Conkler's parents knew that, uh, they would have been a lot more careful as to where a young Megan went. Uh, if I, my sister, uh, uh, has three young children. I would want my sister to know if there was a pedophile living within two or three blocks uh, of her house because I wouldn't want those children uh, running into this pedophile. I have grandchildren and I wouldn't want my grandchildren running into pedophiles. On the other hand, I wouldn't want them growing up in a country in which so many precautions were taken to uh, make life perfectly safe that none of us had any personal liberty. This, this involves a serious infringement on privacy and on liberty, and even the New Jersey Supreme Court, although it 
refused to follow the law <laughs> with respect to punishment, recognized that at least serious privacy and liberty interests are involved here. There's no That's the heritage that. that we ought to be thinking about preserving for our children. When someone is convicted of a, fe of a felony, they deserve to lose some of their rights. They and the, did, and, the and they served their time. The neighborhood has a right to know if someone unsafe is living in their presence. Neighborhoods if, don't have rights. Individuals have rights. I Just, disagree with that. Let me ask you this question. This is, I think you would probably agree, wildly popular legislation in this state. Yes. Are the claims that it may save the lives of children totally bogus, um, mistaken, or is there some minimal value to it which you think is outweighed by the constitutional infirmity? I don't think there's much even minimum value, but I, you can't say no that it has no. Well, if you were in the legislature, would you vote for a statute like making? If I were in the legislature and someone on the eve of election came in with 300,000 signatures on a petition. I would pay attention just as the New Jersey legislatures did. Now they uh, declared a legislative emergency, the assembly didn't hold any hearings, the Senate held only ab abbreviated hearings, and in a couple of weeks they rushed this law through, and of course the emergency was plain. The emergency was the November 8th election. These laws were passed. Uh, uh, promptly in October and signed on October 31st. It, they should not be referred to as Megan's laws, they should be referred to as Hattayan laws. Um, it, that was the emergency. Is the Third Circuit going to uphold Megan's law? Judge you first since you argued the case. Well, I, I think I'll refrain from making a prediction about the outcome of a case that I argued. Uh, Jay? I think You're, they are going to basically uphold it. I think that uh, they may make it just just prospective. Um, um, the attorney general for the state of New Jersey has an, um, now made it that a judge has to make the decision as opposed to the prosecutor making the decision. The decision I have to make now is to end the show and to thank you, Judge Gibbons and Jay Fahey, for being here with us. And that's it for this edition of Due Process. Though we'd like to hear from you, please write us at Due Process, NJN, CN 777, Trenton, New Jersey, 08625-0777. And join us next time when we'll take you behind the bar in municipal court. Till then, for Due Process, I'm Ray Brown. And what you're doing is, on one hand, you have people who abide by the law all their lives. You look at my family. My husband and I, we were raised to, to uh, obey the law. We teach our children to obey the law, to be the best people they can be. I have a dead little girl because somebody couldn't control himself. Not only did he rape her, but he murdered her. And that's something we have to live with forever. And I look, on, look at it and I think, you know, here, um, he raped and murdered my daughter. And he has more rights than she did. Where were her rights? She's dead. Major funding for due process was made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding was provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, publishers of print and electronic information for and about the legal community, including the legislative manual.